So, um, the, um, the talk, as uh, Salva said, is uh, getting a large-ish application on the test. It uh, could have been called uh, how to really fail implementing tests for a large application. Uh, because that's basically what we did. Um, uh, but hopefully I'll be able to share with you how we got out of the issues we created for ourselves. Um, our, uh, well, if, first of all, um, how many people here have an application with tests? Right, so that's basically everyone that's fantastic not uh, not every tech crowd uh, can uh, can brag about that uh, then the next question is how many of you write tests right so nearly all some a bit uncertain <laughs> and the last question how many of you do test driven development right so Basically, some but few. Uh, important distinction, uh, those three questions are really different, and the, the amount of hands really, really display that. Um, the, depending on your organization, these things will, will vary a lot. Um, but that's useful for me to know. Um, our, oh, for just the background information, we have a fairly large Modulicious application. Um, we chose Modulicious because of the ease of development, the, the high pace of changes in Modulicious, and um, how little code we actually needed to write ourselves. I mean, just look, look at how easy it is to get tests running. And the, the concise uh, setup for that, it, Fantastic, and um, just the general quality of Modulicious is why we uh, we chose it. Uh, but the code base was uh, fairly large. Uh, if we include the whole uh, project without dependencies, etc., I think we're about seventy thousand something lines of code in various uh, various areas. Uh, most of it is Perl. Uh, some of it is HTML templates, etc. Um, but uh, it's, it's a lot, and uh, this is basically handled by a team of two developers, uh, one UX designer, and one uh, web front-end guy gluing it all together. Um, this was a product that was supported by a sort of a r and grant here in, uh, in Norway, uh, meaning that we, had, we basically had to deliver because if we didn't, we didn't get money. Uh, we had partners betting on us being able to deliver. So they were going out to their customers saying, yeah, you should buy this great product. It's great. Uh, and it was not done. Um, we were just coding furiously. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, we're a small team. Uh, at the time, we had very little time to get things done, and we had even less money. Uh, we were basically burning uh, some some saved capital and some um, investor capital uh, <laughs> very quickly. So, the uh, process, if you will, uh, for us, uh, when we worked at an, at an early stage, uh, everyone was sitting in isolation. Um, we were at the same office, but because of time constraints, we couldn't really discuss all the things we wanted to discuss. Um, we had to pretty strictly assign roles and responsibilities for the different parts of the, the application. So there was very little overlap between the different roles. Um, this meant that we were solving the same problems in multiple different ways. Um, this is not uncommon, but it's very unfortunate uh, when it does happen, uh, especially if you want to introduce a new developer to a project and he starts working on the code, see 10 ways of uh, interfacing with the database, and picks the worst one of them, of course, because that's what 
he found on Pearl Monks, uh, dated uh, 2004. Um, and also, we had no tests. That's just extra work, right? So, uh, so yeah, we're just uh, furiously coding and uh, living the life. But basically, we were creating more issues than we were solving. Uh, at the at the moment, we had Trello as our issue tracker. That's a fantastic idea. <laughs> it's so easy to collaborate on coding projects using Trello. Uh, so that meant no automation, uh, no real good ways of getting an overview of what's critical, what's not critical, uh, what are the dependencies here, etc. Uh, they say that it's supposed to be easy, but mm, no, it doesn't work. So, also, we had a uh, general manager who was uh, sending like a pro. Basically, what this meant was I got questions about features, and I said, sure, we can do that. Yeah. Um, this meant all-nighters, manic coding, Quality, not really that great, uh, but we did deliver. Uh, and that's basically how we kept the project alive and our partners uh, happy with us. Um, but it did come at a cost. So one of the results from this was that during every demo, we spotted bugs. Some bugs the customer spotted in the, during the demos, some we spotted and just furiously went to the next step in the demo. Uh, not a pleasant situation to be in. Um, it does not invoke trust. And when your application is uh, a, a product for emergency broadcasting of, um, of messages to the general population, trust is a very important factor. Um, the whole platform had huge inconsistencies. We had, as mentioned, many ways of dealing with databases. We had um, uh, string manipulation helpers that uh, behaved uh, differently. We had uh, usage of want array a couple of places, and that's not really, I don't, well, I don't like it. Um, basically, just a million ways of doing things. Um, it made it hard even for us who knew the code base to keep track of things. Um, and trying to move to a standardized way of doing things just broke stuff all over. So it was just not something we could even start doing uh, at, a, at any scale, at least. And the code quality was abysmal. And that's not the team's fault. That's just a time constraint. And probably a, f a big factor was me spending some nights coding and then handing it over to one of the other guys who had to base his work off of that. It's not a recipe for success. So we had to do a reset. And uh, a pretty hard reset, both on our code base, on our processes, the workflow, etc. Um, we set some goals. Uh, we needed to reduce the all-nighters that we had to pull. Uh, basically, stop uh, saying to customers or potential customers at that time, "Yeah, sure, we can have that done by the day after tomorrow." Um, because it does not give you enough time for discussions, testing, etc. So that had to stop. We wanted to incre increase productivity. Um, the, the amount of time spent just looking around the code to see what your new little change would break, that took a long, long time. So even small features took way too long to implement. And... Um, what we were bragging about, basically, with customers were our high rate of, of, uh, of changes. So when, um, when a, a customer asked us, yeah, can I have that done by, like, in two days, we said, sure, and we did deliver on it, and that set the precedence, and 
as the code base grew, this became more and more difficult, and the code base had a worsening code quality as time passed. Uh, but we needed to also move towards automation. Um, the, the level of automation we had was basically none. We had stuff in Trello, we had uh, no other ways of building and deploying and doing it manually that did not scale. Um, and once we had to set, well, cut the application up into pieces, deploy it various places to, to offload uh, work, then it became cumbersome, to say the least. Um, but we, we set, set down a set of steps that we could, uh, could take. Um, we needed to dis determine what needed testing. And we, we sort of knew this already, the whole application. Uh, <laughs> we didn't have tests at all. Um, we needed to have some way of tracking our progress. If you don't track your progress, well, if you can't track your progress, don't start. Have that as a, a first step so that you can assign responsibilities in the, the whole where you're going to make tests uh, project that you, you're running. Um, and then we needed to actually, actually start writing tests. And that meant um, translating our previous knowledge of uh, doing testing in, um, in Java and C++ and PHP and Ruby and all of that to, to Perl. Um, it was a pleasurable experience. Uh, Test Mojo is fantastic. Uh, very little scaffolding uh, out of the box, and uh, it was basically the tool that I had been wanting since forever, uh, or as long as I've been doing testing in in other languages. Um, and then the next step was, of course, uh, profit. That's uh, that's the end goal here. So. What needed tests? Yep, that's basically it. We, um, we made a list, pasted it into GitLab that we moved to, made the whole list into checkboxes, and uh, off we went. So what you do? You start working alphabetically. That's, that's got to be the best way, right? Mm -hmm. Systematically, and you're... You can track the progress, and you don't have a check mark there, and no check marks, and then one check mark there, and no check marks. It's 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 better this way, right? Anyone? No. No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> um, and the the whole tracking progress thing, uh, as mentioned, we we did um, we did move to GitLab. We also started using some other tools, like uh, DevL Cover. Uh, that was a great help. Uh, it got nice uh, HTML reports. It was uh, sort of easy-ish to get a hold of what we, uh, what we had tested, all the different branches, etc. cetera. Uh, fantastic tool. Um, also, tab for format uh, HTML. Uh, was crucial for us, uh, keeping track of the tests that failed and the tests that succeeded very quickly became impossible for us to do because of the amount of uh, tests we got. The uh, CICD pipeline we set up in, in GitLab was also very important. Uh, and we had we input the simple, small, uh, regular expressions so that for each build we extracted the code coverage percent. This was not very important, this number, uh, except for the whole uh, gaming uh, thing. Uh, it's always nice to see that after uh, two days of coding you're able to uh, improve the uh, the code coverage with one and a half percent. It feels like a huge win. And um, yeah, for me, it was a big motivational thing. So, ready, go. That's uh, basically what we did. Uh, started off uh, enthusiastically and uh, quickly, um, quickly ran into some issues. 
First and foremost of them, we had tight coupling in our application. That was not fun. Um, we had methods depending on basically the whole world being present. Um, if any of you have looked at the solid principles, then we were like breaking all of them. Uh, if you haven't looked at the solid principles, do have a read. Uh, some of them seem sort of artificial um, and are not always applicable, but uh, there's some pretty decent uh, thought work behind, uh, behind the, those principles. And uh, it's something that should be considered uh, to implement as a, as a good practice. Um, we had a lot of uh, monster methods, methods that were five to 900 uh, lines long, not uncommon. Uh, we had daemon processes, basically everything in one .pl script, bad idea. Getting that tested is, well, it's not trivial. Um, tests were taking longer and longer to run. Um, our tests took like half an hour to run. And when, when that happens, the whole motivation behind actually running the test just disappear. I can't stand waiting for anything, but especially not my editor or tests. Those should be instantaneous and they should ideally be run as I code. Uh, and also we saw that our abysmal code quality was bleeding over into the tests. So because of our application being crap, or the application was good, the code quality was crap, uh, that meant the, the tests were becoming crap as well. Uh, and even though Mojo, uh, test mojo is great, that didn't help us at all. Basically we were just making new problems for ourselves. And the, um, the, the, the costs, yeah, it, uh, it went up, just maintaining the tests. So uh, did we profit from, uh, from that whole endeavor? No, not at all. Um, in, in, some, in some cases, you can argue that we did uh, because we reduced the number of errors. But at the same time, our pace of development went down uh, and we spent more and more time just maintaining our tests and that is a very important factor uh, when you're doing uh, doing testing actively consider what kind of maintenance burden you are imposing on on the company when when you start out doing this um, for us our test code base is larger, or actually much larger than, um, than our actual, actual code base. And that's because we do need to test with a lot of weird permutations of data, etc. since we interface with a lot of APIs and some of what we get back is crap. So, so the tests, they're a big, big part of the, the total uh, code base. So we needed a reset again. So we, we had to make some new priorities uh, and address the new issues that we had made for ourselves. First and foremost, we need to spot the high and low risk areas in the code and start writing tests for the most critical parts first. Um, one very easy thing to do, uh, depending on your application, is look, look at what are the parts of the code that produces the highest number of operational incidents? Ally yourself with the operations guy and have him tell you what keeps him up at night. You'll make a friend and uh, you'll probably get uh, good progress and people will generally be more friendly uh, towards getting your code into production more rapidly. Um, we started out in the process saying that we should get our code under tests without changing the code because we knew that the code worked, sort of. Uh, but we saw that 
because of the quality of it, the monster methods, etc., the tests became convoluted and artificial and not good at all. So what we said was basically, okay, we accept some increased risk, but we need to allow some refactoring to happen. That basically meant cutting up the monster methods into smaller methods, just incrementally smaller, and then writing tests for those methods in isolation. We also started doing more dependency injection into methods, and that made it a lot more testable. So uh, that's, uh, that's a tip. If, um, if, you, if you feel that your code requires too much scaffolding to be able to test, look into restructuring it so you do dependency injection. If, you haven't, if you're not familiar with dependency injection, Google it. There's a lot of good resources on it. Uh, and we needed to speed up all the tests because, frankly, it took way too long. Uh, as mentioned, half an hour to run the tests, that's unacceptable in basically, I would say, any environment. That should not happen. So parallelization was a big priority for us. Um, first, we had to make sure that dash J to prove actually worked. It didn't initially, I don't know why, uh, but we restructured some things and made um, parts of the application not being dependent on too much of the rest of the application and make sure, made sure that parallel runs didn't interfere with the same files, etc. cetera. Uh, so that was the, the first step. That helped a bit, but still we had uh, bottlenecks. Then we started using ephemeral databases. What this meant was that for a particular test file, or basically for every test file, we spin up a new Postgres database. This is super cheap today, doing, um, in, in terms of uh, computational resources. Uh, and this meant that we didn't have to wait on migrations and the test runs and the, the cleanups, etc., and have all the tests sequentially use the same database we could create 40 databases at the same time. And that's a non-issue today on, uh, on current hardware. Uh, and the nice thing about this is it takes about 30 lines of code if you write it extremely verbose and even add some uh, comments. Uh, so just creating a database, running your tests, making sure that the database is uh, dropped after the tests are run. Super simple and something everyone should do. Um, Develop Cover had a bug <laughs> that I did spend a couple of nights figuring out um, why it did what it did. Um, so Develop Cover uses a JSON file to, to track the coverage. And that's all well and good. You have Develop Cover spinning up a test, it records its progress, saves it to the file. St a new instance is started, reads the file, tracks its progress, writes the file again. The problem being, when you parallelize things, then you have the, the one process starting, reading the file, and then you have the, the second process starting, reading the file as the first process is trying to write through the file, and then all of a sudden you have corrupted JSON. That's no fun. So basically, any run we had that used, used parallel, parallelized uh, tests got garbage test coverage, uh, just basically invalid uh, JSON. Um, that bug was uh, fixed, so now it's all uh, well and good. Now we get coverage even for parallelized <coughs> runs. Um, and we needed to address the workflow as well. Um, one of the parts we, we did was converting to a more predictable directory structure. So if, you're, if the file you were testing was the module uh, my app controller foo, you would find tests for that module in the directory my app slash controller slash foo dot t. Uh, this made it so that I could have my editor 
find the test files for the, uh, the particular code I was testing very easily. Uh, it made it so that when you needed to figure out where a particular uh, part of the code was tested, you knew where to look. Uh, we also started depending heavily on subtests, uh, and that was more a readability issue. You you got the the tests structure indented uh, in a way, and you got a group of tests failing. So you had a subtest for the method bar, and yeah, basically when you looked at the tap output or the HTML output it was structured more in a more readable fashion. And it was also easier when just scrolling through the code, looking for a particular piece of, of tests. Uh, it was b easier to be able to see uh, where those tests started and stopped. And, and when you do need a bit of a scaffolding, then yeah, that kind of uh, thing, those kinds of things helped. Uh, we started softly enforcing style um, we could have uh, used all the, the good tools for this. We didn't. We didn't feel it was important enough. Uh, we just agreed on some common sense things uh, regarding an indentation, placement of brackets, etc. And didn't spend a whole lot of time uh, enforcing it. And this worked, uh, worked out pretty well. Um, and we started discussing the different problems we needed to solve uh, more often. Uh, th this did help in spotting inconsistencies, uh, getting better ways of solving the, the issues we, th we had, and generally in uh, increasing uh, the code quality. Another important factor here is um, the, um, the general skill level increased. Since when one of uh, the guys in the company discovered something new and fancy, he could relay that to the rest of us and say that, oh, if you just do this, that part becomes much more easy. So that, um, that made it better. Uh, and also, allowing refactoring made it a lot easier to address the big issues we had. When we said that, okay, we can take these big methods and extract parts of it into, into new methods, we saw that, okay, we can actually start reusing code. That's, that's great. Uh, and I, I know there's a big uh, movement against reusing code, uh, at least these days. Uh, and, and even some companies have active policies against code reuse. Um, but uh, for our purposes, it uh, code reuse made sense. So we started doing that and seeing if we could structure our modulicious helpers in a more predictable manner than uh, we had uh, previously. Um, and I am purposefully cutting this talk a bit short and that's to allow for, for discussions or questions if, uh, if anyone have them. Uh, I would just like to point out one thing and that's the culture you've got and that you, you maintain has a huge influence on the effectiveness of uh, your tests. It's something that needs to be actively worked on. People need to see that having the tests actually makes their lives better. It, may, uh, it means you have to spend time on tooling if you don't, it's just a burden, and no one likes a burden in, in an already busy, uh, busy day. So do spend some time looking at the workflow, making, a, making testing this positive thing that helps you. Um, and that's, uh, I, I would say that's probably one of the most important things. Cherish good code, don't go bananas. Um, and make sure everyone is happy. Address the issues they have and gripes with running the tests, different platforms, etc. So, happy testing. Do you have any questions?
Hi. Uh, yeah, so great talk. And um, you said you started allowing for discussions, discussing problems. Yeah. Um, and does that, did that mean, so, okay, so there was one thing that I didn't hear. So you, you didn't mention code review at any point. And of course, this is testing, but that's, I mean, and you can do code review for so many reasons. But since you're discussing problems before they're solved, is there maybe some kind of discussing like after they're solved or attempted solved or something like that? Did you have a change in culture there? Um, we we did some changes to how we worked. Um, uh, just one question. Is uh, questions recorded as well? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, it's in the yeah. Fantastic. Um, we at, let's say at, at the time uh, in our history where I have uh, stopped, our, stopped this uh, presentation, we did not have a good culture for code reviews. Uh, I believe code reviews are one of the things you learn the most from, uh, both the person reviewing and the, the reviewee, I guess you could say. Um, if we had enough time, if we had a bigger team and were able to spend more time on those kinds of things, we would have done code reviews much earlier. Uh, what we did start doing, though, was using feature branches. And that made changes a lot more visible, at least when you were working on a big feature set. Uh, and it also meant that uh, I or one of the other guys in the team could go in and follow code process and just do it like in between things. You go to the loo and you open GitLab on your phone and you watch the latest commits and uh, you comment on uh, whatever needs commenting. Um, but yeah, uh, structured code reviews is something that I believe is a very good thing. Um, I do not believe in setting a time for doing code reviews and then you do code reviews for uh, 10 merge requests. Uh, just doing it in between so that your workday is varied and not as uh, static as a developer workdays uh, can be. But yeah, absolutely. Code reviews, good thing. Uh, let's imagine uh, you need to start new project tomorrow. Uh, will you use your new approach uh, with uh, tests, uh, with uh, coverage, and so on and so on, or will it be all night coding to just <laughs> deliver it faster? Uh, great question. We um, we have established a new workflow. Uh, basically, meaning that we we generate a new project in a way that we get all the different pipelines, etc., and all the automation set up for us. That's an import important first step. Um, starting out with automation, great thing. Um, then we make sure that all, all the work we do is done in feature branches. We actively have merge requests going back into our development branch. Uh, we do not allow mergers without a review of, uh, of the code in question. Um, so and and also we we do not allow uh, code changes without tests for for the new the new projects. Uh, of course, it does slip up. On some occasions, I just do the thing, <laughs> and that's a bad thing. Uh, I shouldn't really, uh, <laughs> but it does happen. And um, uh, in some cases, it is the right thing to do, depending on the crit criticality of uh, the issue. But uh, it, it should really be frowned upon. And uh, I believe that the test-first approach is far superior to anything else. So yeah. OK, so I think you might have answered, but your new workflow is that test driven or like if you if you have some new feature that doesn't depend on a lot of legacy and you, you start with a new file and right. it merges it, it's a feature branch and, or something like that. Yeah, we uh, 
it, it varies, I think, is the right answer. Uh, I don't think uh, always doing tests first is a good approach. <laughs> Oftentimes, I might uh, hash out some code just to see, will uh, do I have the gen general idea of how I want to solve things? If so, I delete the code. And then I start working on my tests. Because when I have worked through the conceptual issues, it is much easier for me to create a test structure and work systematically on solving the more difficult parts of whatever implementation I'm doing. Uh, so you mentioned that you've been using uh, dependency injection a bit. I, this is something I'm more often hear of a solution for things like Java. I would I wonder if you could say a little bit more practical about what kind of things it solved for you using Perl development. Well, it, it's not uh, specifically for for Perl, but it, um, for example, injecting a database handle in a method. Um, makes it easier for me to, in some cases, just mock the whole database interaction, the few places where we actually do that. Um, and also for um, overriding certain issues with, um, with API calls we do. So we try to test various failure scenarios. We use the Mojo user agent. And we are probably using it incorrectly in, in our tests. Uh, but what we did have was this whole convoluted system of uh, overriding the transport and making that fail and overriding whatever else in there and making that fail just to, so that we got a, a good coverage for the various scenarios that the API providers we use actually have. Like, sending uh, responses with a uh, serial length uh, header, but they're actually being JSON in there, or just JSON that's cut at some point, or wrong encoding. All, all of these things, uh, I, there are modules now that makes this easier, but uh, that's one example where injecting things uh, helped us uh, just reduce the, the complexity in our scaffolding, basically. Did it answer the question? Anyone else? Do you have any insights when to stop refactoring? You know, for instance, <laughs> let's say you have this monster method with a couple of hundred lines. You start right. dissecting it. You see five function calls. Look at these functions. They're the same size. Yeah. Um, for myself, I try to limit methods to between 15 and 20 lines of code. Uh, and this makes it so that I can have that method on my screen and I can have related stuff above and below on my screen as well. That's just more of a practical matter. Uh, but the, the biggest benefit is um, when I write the tests for that code, the subtest becomes small as well. I don't end up with 200 lines of of tests in a uh, in a subtest for a method for of fifty lines, for example, um, and there are fewer permutations and branches in the in the code that needs testing for that one method. Um, one thing I am I, or try to be cognizant about is uh, the the whole um, arrowhead pattern. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, you see code. Uh, you have uh, if this, uh, if this, if that. You have a for loop, and then you have an if, and then you have an else, and then inside that you have another while loop. Craziness. Um, if I at any time need an indentation level of more than two, I refactor. So they, I, I believe there should never be indentation levels above two in code. Um, my point was actually... Um, when trying to refactor, I have one function. I try to refactor it, but I realize in other parts of the code base, there are still functions or parts um, which need refactoring. Do I, st 
stop refactoring the initial one and start refactoring those? Or when do I stop refactoring and actually write tests? Or Right. Uh, so what keeps you up at night? When does the uh, ops team or or you have to respond to critical issues? That's um, I don't know if I mentioned it, but that was also an uh, an issue that we had with our first workflow. What we did was we said, yeah, for a file to be marked as complete, we had to have a test coverage of 100%. Uh, that was a major mistake. So. Once we change to having um, a sort of good enough level, so say you you approach 80-90% test coverage in method, that's great. You don't really need to refactor the method simply for readability. If you had if you have decent enough test coverage and um, there are no critical issues popping up every now and then, but when you do get critical issues you solve it and you do it properly. So high risk code, make sure to get high test coverage, make sure that the the tests you write not only give you high test quality, not uh, test coverage, but also have a quality and readability that makes it easy to maintain. And that's especially important for high risk code. Did it answer the question? Yeah. Is that <coughs> One final question. Could you talk a little bit about uh, GitLab and the automations that you're using there? Yeah, sure. Um, the um, the initial, um, well, what we started off with in GitLab was something as simple as making sure the tests run. That was the first thing we did. Uh, and if, if you're not using GitLab, uh, you should definitely check it out. It's a great tool. Uh, the whole uh, DevOps thing is something they've really embraced. Uh, it, they do make it a lot easier than some of the competitors. Uh, and also, compared to some of the competitors, they, you can get off uh, pretty cheaply using uh, GitLab. But uh, to be specific on uh, the well, well, what we did, we, we started off just running the tests. Um, we have we have done some like Docker things, uh, not much in in GitLab because we haven't moved to a whole containerization, containerization uh, workflow. Uh, so, first and foremost, for for us, the automation in GitLab has been running tests, generating coverage, storing artifacts from the the build artifacts being HTML test reports. Also, oh, if you do this, um, tap format a HTML has got two options you want to pass to it. Inlining CSS and inlining JavaScript. Um, there is an open issue still, I believe, um, on the whole um, inlining bit uh, where some JavaScript is included twice. Can't remember how we solved that, but that was an issue. So when you clicked to expand a, a group of tests, it would automatically close again. So you had to disable JavaScript in your browser while looking at the test report. But uh, but yeah, getting coverage information into the list of artifacts for a build job, very important, and uh, getting uh, the test Oh, yeah, both the coverage and the test results, that was important. Um, and I would say, if you haven't got automation like this, that would be the, the place to start. Uh, for us, the, the next logical step is containerizing basically everything. Uh, but we have a lot of um, uh, knowledge building we need to, to do before we move everything over to, to containers. So. Did it answer the question? Yeah. Also, we are hiring. So if any of you uh, want a job doing Perl and whatever else is out there in the tech world, um, talk to me. Or if you know someone who needs a job. Uh, I think that was the last question. Final takers. Right. 
Thank you very much.